game. Um, and uh, let's start uh, with a couple of warm-up puzzles. So uh, for the audience here live, there is going to also be an online audience today, unlike on Thursday, which is why yeah, the, the content will be <clears throat> a bit more advanced than it was on Thursday, just because there's sometimes masters show up in the, in the YouTube and some very, very strong players. Um, but I'll try to do my best to explain things uh, as simple as possible. Before I go into what exact topic we're talking about, um, you know, let's, um, let's try to figure out how do you think black should play here. And um, this is actually a little bit of a follow up on uh, Caleb, um, Caleb's lecture. Uh, interestingly enough, this was not pre-planned. It was just happens to be like that, which kind of <laughs> kind of fitting. So, um, what would you do for black here, and why? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I guess it's, uh, I guess it's fine. I, I mean, it, it's just, I think, the, it's just that the, for me, it's different yeah, because I'm... Yeah, press it, yeah, we all gotta wear masks now. Okay, sure, yeah. Pardon me. Not my call. Yeah, Lombardi Fisher, yes. Yes, very good. Yes, so what we do here is we transition into this king and pawn endgame. Uh, king d5, king c4, and then we play b6, a5. And then we make an outside pass pawn and, uh, and uh, we win the game. So yeah, because of the outside pass pawn. Um, okay. So the topic today is going to be uh, transitioning into the king and pawn endgame and basically trying to understand when it's good, when it's not good. Uh, you know, so let's look at uh, the next example. Um, actually, let's do the, this one first. All right, this is also, I think, a fairly straightforward one. Um, how should white play in this position? Okay. All right. Bishop takes, pawn takes. Then, um, yeah, I guess. All right. That's a, it's a possibility. Um, let's see any any other ideas? Yeah. Start with rook d1, but to force the pay rook to take what? Um, okay, we can also do that. We'll go over both of these options. Okay. Um, but let's see if any other ideas for, for white.
All right, so let's see, we have a G5 suggestion. Okay, so, so far everybody has kind of suggested parts of the right answer, but nobody got the, the, the full thing. So let's continue analyzing. Okay, well, somebody just got it, yes. Bishop takes f6, g takes f6, rook d1. So, right, because this way we guarantee uh, a transition into a, into a king and pawn endgame by taking and then playing um, rook d1. Did I say uh, bishop takes f6? You did say that, but you said follow up with g5. No, I, I said that. No, I said that. Oh. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize that it was uh, like him following your idea, sorry. It's, um, yeah, um, but I think it's important to see this rook d1 move as well, because if you don't play rook d1, then um, it's not that clear. But um, yeah, rook d1 takes, takes, and then what happens is white has a chance to make a, a pass pawn. Black could stop it, but then white makes a pass pawn on this side of the board as well. b5 takes c5, and white is, uh, white is winning. Um, so, um, we don't start with D1 knight takes G4. yeah, rook d1, yeah, I mean, you can take, take and go knight e8, for example, or even knight takes g4, right, so these are some of the small problems, um, and if you take, take g5, which was mentioned, um, uh, then, um, then you don't have to take hg, which would allow rook d1 you can play something like rook d8 or rook d4, and then the rook is able to be on, on the board. Um, and g5 was also suggested, but then we play knight takes h5. Okay, so uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's look at uh, the next one. All right, now the next ones will be significantly more more difficult so you know we'll try to kind of go through them step by step this one does not seem to be supposed to be so difficult because it's just queen and pawn against queen and pawn but actually it's uh there are some nuances so so let's try this white to play what should white do All right, queen g5 is a very interesting try. <clears throat> um, obviously, th this is a trickier one, right? Because there are many transitions into king and pawn endgames we can have here, right? So we we need to decide which one would be the one that's that's favorable for us. So so queen, g if we play queen g5, uh, if he takes, then that will be winning for white uh, because we have this. Uh, we have this pawn on the fifth rank. And here, the only thing we have to know is not to go king f6, because then here we cannot play g6 because of stalemate. So whenever we have a g pawn, it's important to go king h6, king h8, g6, and then g g7. Um, yeah. Um, but um, instead of going queen takes g5, black could play something like queen f3. And, uh, and then black will start giving a lot of checks. And, uh, and then it's not entirely easy for, for white to, to play here. It's going to be a draw because it's going to be very hard to get out of all these checks. Um, all right, so 
what else could white consider? So queen g5 is a good try, but he does not have to take. And chess is uh, not checkers. Right? You're not forced to take. It's important. Uh, king f6. Yeah, and then, well, I mean, what can we play? Um, king f6. Okay. Uh, very good. You got it. King f6 is the best move. Um, so we will take a look at that in a second, but let's just quickly see why the other moves um, are not as good. Uh, a lot of students suggest the move queen h5. And then f5, but then it's just a draw. You know, we queen at equal times. Um, and um, also people suggest king f8 with the idea that after this takes g5 here, 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 queen, white is winning. But after this, black actually has queen f5. And this is still a draw because after takes, takes here, Black needs to play precisely. Go king h8, or the only drawing move. That way, after this and this, we're able to go king f7 and uh, get the opposition going in front of the, the pawn. Um, and king f7, we can play g5. Um, but king f6 is the absolutely best move here. Um, and uh, now, if you go queen e5, f e5, king g8, this is winning trivially because of takes here, 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 and king e6. We get the opposition. Um, if uh, queen h4, we go king f7, queen h6, let's say queen f6, and black is in zugzwang. Black is forced to either lose a pawn or, or get mated. And, uh, and finally, Black has one more interesting try, king h6. After which the win is still a bit tricky. So let's see if anyone could find this. I mean, you're not really obligated to see that ahead of time if you play king f6, but I guess it's good to try to find now as, a, as an exercise. Believe it or not, it's still the only way to win here. It's kind of not that, not that obvious. It was not even mentioned in the book, by the way, from where I got the problem, king h6, which is kind of an important omission by the book author. Um, okay, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the problem with queen g5 is actually after takes, takes king h5. Um, this is a mutual zugzwang. We're actually the ones we're actually the ones that that is that that is losing here yeah All right, looks like fun smart content got it.
king of seven. And now if queen of five, take, take king of six. And after g5, we have king f8, threatening queen g7. And uh, after this, we have queen h8. Uh, yeah, and we're threatening queen g7. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is the winning idea for white, king f7. But yes, very nice. King f6, very important move, only winning move here. Okay. Let's see some other examples. Okay, here's an interesting uh, rook endgame uh, puzzle. So it's black to play. Black could play rook a1 immediately, or he can give a check first, and then play rook a1 next move. Uh, which one do you think is better and, and why? Oh, uh, okay, why? Well, for one, it puts the king in check. Okay. But, so uh, why... Go ahead, I'm sorry. So why would you want to have the king on e6 or e7 or somewhere else instead of d6? For black. Because you're going to have to play rook a1 next move anyway. So... I'm assuming it would have been... Oh, I was tricking. I was looking at something different. I was thinking white. It's okay. All right, so we have not checking allows the bridge with rook d8, rook d7. Um, rook a1, rook d8, rook a6, right, maybe rook e8. Okay, so so basically what we, we, what we have to realize is that if black plays, let's say, an immediate rook a1 or whatever, white has only one winning idea here. Um, because if he's going to try to get close to the pawn, he's just going to be forever checked. Right, so that's not gonna be able to win, right? So the only winning possibility for white is to somehow move the rook away and then try to exchange the rooks. So for example, rook d8 or rook c8, rook e8 somewhere, and then after takes rook check, and then exchange the, the rooks. Try to get a winning, winning um, king and pawn endgame. And now we just have to understand which of the pawn endgames will be winning and which one will be, will be a draw. All right, so the question is, what should white uh, do in this position? Uh, I mean, sorry, what should black do? Should we go rook d1 first or should we play rook a1? Um, I see some discussion going on on YouTube, some relevant discussion. So I'll give you guys maybe a a minute or two more.
All right, rook d1 prevents, prevents uh, bridge building. Okay, well, it doesn't technically, but we'll... So the uh, first question is after rook a1, what is, the, what is the move that white has to play? What is the move white should play to try to have any winning chances? There are three ways to try to exchange rooks, but only one way that actually accomplishes it. So which, which one white would need to play? Mm, no, the pawn's going like this. Pawn's going like this. So this is the next square, like we're trying to queen. Oh, it's going okay, yes. Going confused, right? right, right. It's going. Yes. Uh, yeah, if you go king e6, I'll I'll give a check and then I'll go back. Right. That's that's not really gonna give you anything. Even if you play e5. You know, even if somehow you take play this position, you're not going to be able to get the g5 pawn. But even if somehow you do, this is still a draw. This is still a draw because with the pawn array all the way on a7 and with the g pawn, you can never make progress. G or an h pawn because the king just stays there and you don't have progress to be made. So the only idea is moving the rook, but where? Rook d8 actually would be a mistake because after rook a6 check we're not able to make progress we're just going to lose the pawn and we're not going to be able to exchange same thing after rook e8 after rook e8 there is rook a6 check very strong check again disturbs our harmony and then we're going to take on a7 and there's no no way to make progress unfortunately so the only way to guarantee a rook trade is rook c8 because then after check, we have rook c6. I mean, we don't have to trade rooks, but then of course we will, now we'll lose this rook endgame because now the king will get to b8 and white will be able to promote the pawn fairly easily. So black uh, will play rook takes a7 at some point or, and then, um, we give this check. And now the question is, is this a winning position for white or not? And the answer is yes, it's winning because we have a distant opposition here, three squares apart, and black has to, you know, play like this. And then eventually we will go here and do this outflanking strategy. We win the pawn and then the rest is, is very simple. So we need to play rook c8. But if we start with rook d1 check, white plays king e6, and then we go here, now rook c8 does not work anymore. So, and rook e8 does not work because of the check. So the only option then is to play rook d8. If rook takes a7, rook d7. But the difference now is this position is a draw because it's it's black to play and black has a way to get the opposition but it's still not over we need to know exactly how we get the opposition because uh, there's only one move that still draws here and we have to be very very careful so what is the drawing move for black here Very good, king h7, because if we go king f7, we will not be able to maintain the opposition because of this pawn. So after this, for example, here, 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 we will lose, right? But after the very important move king h7, now it's black who gets the opposition. And no matter what white does, black is able to make the, the draw. So if we go all the way back here, you see how first you have to identify white's only winning idea here, white's only winning plan. And once we've established white's winning plan, then we need to understand 
wherever we need their king to be for their plan not to work as well. And you have to be able to understand king and pawn games in order to do that, right? So you see how in all of these examples so far, in order to be able to play properly these queen and rook end games, you have to understand the basic concepts of the pawn end games. That's why to all of you who are learning end games, make sure you start with the pawn end games. Because if you don't know your pawn end games, you know, like it's two plus two, then um, the other end games will be even just hard, much, that much harder. It's the same thing as trying to learn algebra without understanding arithmetic, right? So that's why pawn end games are the most important, the basic pawn end games. Um, all right, so let's continue. Okay, so here's an, an, another interesting question. So white has an opportunity, of course, to play knight d6 and exchange everything on e8. Um, should white do it or not? Should white go into the pawn endgame here or not? Important question, why or why not? Try to give as detailed of an answer as possible. If you think they should not, explain what would be the drawing line for black or winning line. If yes, explain the winning line till then. So. So in other words, should white play knight d6 followed by rook e8 or white should white not? By the way, to those of you who are very interested in this topic, uh, liquidation into pawn endgames, there is a book out there, Joel Benjamin, Grandmaster, legendary Grandmaster Joel Benjamin wrote this book. Um, won multiple US championships. He wrote a book, whole book, just on the topic of liquidating in two pawn end games. So if you guys like this topic, make sure you, you get this book. Um, okay, anyway, so white to play. Do we go knight d6 or not? I wouldn't be even surprised if some of these end games are in his book, or maybe not, I'm not sure. Okay, but yeah, we have an outside pass pawn, true, but black also has his own stuff going on in the king side too, so we have to... Uh, okay, so let's, um, let's go over this. So, chess king says after knight d6 here, takes, 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 king g3, f5, then he goes king d7, king c6, stops the pawn. Okay, that's this in that sense, black he's right that this is already good for black because even if white plays e4 here, black plays f4, gets a protected pass pawn. And now this will only be a draw. This will be a this will be a draw after a5, b5. Um so King Lear says we should swap and follow by King G3. Uh, I think in that case I can go F5 and then E4 and, or something like that. And then I think also this is, a, this is a draw because I have a protected pass pawn and you cannot win here. But um, a few people said that E4 we can play here. And that is the key point of this position because the point of E4 is that when he goes g6, we go here, <clears throat> f5 takes, takes, and now we have pass pawns on both sides of the board, right? And now we're able to win the game. He cannot possibly stop both pass pawns. And these pawns could be blockaded, at least for now. Okay, maybe in, the, in like 10 moves, black can win, but white is way, way faster here. And uh, I mean, he can try not to play f5, but then white also wins with h5 and then the, he will come around and win the, the f6 pawn. Um, so pretty much no matter what black does, the key move to be able to find is this move e4, which kind of stops these pawns on the tracks, knowing that you can't, cannot play g6 f5 giving white, the f, given, giving white the h5 pawn. And now you just prepare king g3, king g4, h5, king f5, b4, a4, and white is kind of um, kind of better. 
Um, okay, so white instead played king g3 and uh, king g3 first, but the problem is now black was able to play rook h7 and uh, knight d6, king e7, and uh, black does not, a white is not able to get into the king and king and pawn end game anymore, and this becomes uh, later on the game ended up being a draw. So if you see a transition, you know, it might be winning, you have to really try to calculate it, explore all your options. Okay. This was also from a famous game, I think it was Smyslov. All right, so here, black to play. What should black, black what should black do? All right, uh, so rook e7 is, uh, is the, the correct move. Uh, because after rook e7, you take take. Well, actually, I don't think we're playing king d7 here. I think because then king e5, we, we still have this pass pawn we can try to make here. And I think white's king is pretty active. I think, in fact, we want to play king f6, trying to go king g5 and try to make a pass pawn here. I think that's the, that's the idea. In the game there was this, this, and then came g6 and h5. All right, so rook e7 was the correct idea. Um, all right, for this one, I'll give you guys a tactical puzzle first and then we'll look at an end game as well. So this is a game Smirnov against Abdusatorov, both very talented young players. Abdusatorov is very young. He became a GM when he was 12 or maybe 13 at, at most. Um, um, okay, so here's an exercise for you. So um, what should white do in this position. Make sure you don't just give one move, but give a give the follow up. Sorry, Rene, what was that supposed to mean? I'm a little bit confused. Um, uh, yeah, rook d8 does not work because of f takes g5, right?
if we go queen g7 queen g7 rook d8 that does not work uh, yeah that here we lose a piece um, so queen g4 is the correct move but the question is what happens in case of rook f4 what's the what's the idea here Yes, exactly. Rook d8. That's the key move. I think that's what white missed. Right? He just maybe stopped up for rook f4, but rook d8 is completely winning. It's going to be takes, takes, and he's going to be up two exchanges. Uh, if rook d8, queen takes, and queen g7. And rook d3, you know, you take, take, queen a4. So the real point why we go queen g4 is because if uh, in the game white played queen g6 it also looks very promising we're threatening rook d8 but the problem is black is able to play rook d3 and uh, limit the damage yeah and then the game proceeded for like many moves and you know white should still probably be winning but you know white was having a hard time converting it and then after a bunch of moves were made I want to get to an important uh, moment here. Yeah, so white kind of messed it up, and now we got this position. Um, what should black uh, do this? What should black do here? Oh, why bishop a4 split? Yeah, I guess he, black also made a blunder, yes, probably. Um, so, all right, looks like Mia Me got it. Uh, yes, PMD got it too. Yes, yeah, so if we play a normal move like Queen C5, we're probably not going to win, right? And after queen d3, queen d3, if we just take back, this is also not winning because king e4. But the key idea to find is this very nice king e6 waiting move. Because the thing is, he's not actually threatening to, he cannot save his queen anyway. And that gives us a very important tempo to, you know, to activate our king. And now black is winning here by one tempo. Of course, here we play king b3. And we don't allow the king to get to c3, and black will promote the pawn, let's say here. And then import move king b2, of course. a4 would still allow the draw, but king b2, of course. All right. Next one. Okay, this is uh, looks like a study, but this is actually from a real game. This was Azma Perashvili against uh, Ye Zhan Xian, two very strong grandmasters. How should white convert it? So white is clearly better. He can win a pawn if he wants. He can do several things. He has a very active king. Black's king is in a dangerous spot. But how should white try to, to win this position? Okay, I mean, if you can do that, that would be nice. But how can we do that? Can we actually do that? All right, queen b6, king c8. King d8.
So queen takes a5 is a very tempting. So the checks don't really lead to anything. So we have to look for captures and maybe checkmate threats, the other forcing moves. Um, queen takes a5 looks like it should win. Um, but black has a fascinating way to make a draw here. Um, let's see if anyone can actually find the draw for black after queen a5. Because queen a5 looks like it wins too. Because like a lot of these pawn endgames look like they're winning. But black has a really nice way to make the draw. Which white I'm sure missed during the game. Queen d6, queen b6. Well, it's a check. Queen b6 is a check. It doesn't look like it works. It looks like we've forced to trade queens, but until we realize that we don't have to take king c8 or king a8. And if we take it, it's a stalemate. So white cannot take. But then if he does not take, then we start checking, right? We get counterplay and this becomes uh, a draw. So queen a5 does not win because of this fascinating reason that we don't have to go into the king and pawn game. But queen c6 does win. So if queen here, we win the following way. We go queen b5 check, takes, takes, let's say a4, a try. But then, of course, we take with the king, not the pawn. We don't want the a pawn. And after this, we get the opposition. Uh, are you calling it the Eric Rose idea? Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, and if here, this is also a win because we, ha we have a spare tempo to gain. Um, but black does not give up yet so easily. He plays queen b4, trying to stop the mate. And, you know, now you have to decide how you proceed here. White needs to find one more strong move. So if he wants to win the game. Uh, if you go queen a4, then I'll happily exchange queens with you, and then you're going to be stuck with the a pawn, with which you cannot ever win when the king stops it. So the a pawn is in notoriously known for being drawish. Um, if we play queen b5 check, it looks like it wins, because after this it's the same thing, but he doesn't have to take, he can play king c8. And then it's not easy to win because after this, for example, the king is able to get the opposition. Now you, we can probably still go back and go and maybe, maybe we can still win. Sorry, with some move like queen f5, but uh, we, we would still have to find the correct idea after king b8 anyway, right? So, so yeah, we might as well find it right away and queen b6 is also a mistake because then takes takes a4 is an immediate draw and if we go check and queen e7 we're gonna lose the queen so we don't want to do that Queen d7. Queen, queen, where did you say d5? Or b5? 
Yeah, b5 we already looked at, king c. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, queen, queen d7 is very powerful. Because we're threatening queen d8 mate. Yeah, their black has no checks and um, you cannot stop either queen d8 or queen b7. Or, I mean, you cannot stop all the mates at once. So, yeah, this is very nice. What will be the next move after this? Queen d8 checkmate. Okay. Yeah, that's what. That's the threat. Yeah, black is lost. Um, let's just see what we have. Okay, this is a game I played against uh, your future GM in residence, uh, Brian Smith. You guys will see him in a week. Um, in fact, I think he's coming even a little bit earlier, but his, his residence officially starts on November 10th, I think. Um, yeah, so this is a game I played against him, and at some point we had this end game. And uh, the question is, should black play queen f7 or not? Why or why not? Why not? Because if the queen takes on uh, f7, the king is. I mean, yeah, it's forced to take. Well, technically, no. I mean, white could. White has other moves too, right. but, but I feel like if white does not take, queen f7 looks like kind of a favorable move for black. But um. Yeah, I mean, queen f7 is, uh, of course, a committal move. So, so what do you guys think? Should is queen of seven good for black, and why or why not? So the real question is, what happens after queen takes of seven? Does does white win? Is it a draw, or does white lose? That's uh, s that's the real question. All right, so how? So queen takes, king takes. How does white win? Uh, All right, so I'll play e5. Yeah, so I want to go king e6, king d6, and claim that I have a passed pawn, and and you don't, so. All right, so let's try to look at it a little bit deeply. Yeah, so this is a, a little bit of a, of a trick question. Um, I'll give you maybe one or two more minutes. So the real question is after queen f7, would you, would you exchange or would you not? Like it's uh, queen f3. Okay, queen f3 is a different story. I mean, queen f3 at least we don't have to take then. The king up. Yeah. Also, we don't don't forget h5 in some lines is hanging maybe. But then, I mean, then we take d6, right? Yeah. I mean, 
But okay, if, if, if queen takes f7 wins, then, you know, you really want to play queen f7, don't you? So, but if it loses, then probably we play a, another move, whatever it is. So, so the real question is not what the best move is, just evaluate queen f7. Like, what happens after queen f7? Is white winning, is white losing, or is it a draw? Well, if we go queen f7 and g6, I don't think that's good because takes, 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 and then we, we're gonna now lose here. Yeah. Um, okay. Some someone says king g3. Yes. Yeah, so the correct idea is actually queen f7 is the best move, and white actually wins. Those of you who thought white wins, congratulations. But the question is how, because this one it looks like black is winning. But the key thing that I missed when I played queen f7 was I missed this move king f3 which is uh, which is extremely annoying and he gains a very important tempo and now it turns out that when i play here king e4 king e7 king takes e5 and king d7 black white has a very annoying move here which which wins him the game which what is the move Well, actually, may, I'm thinking now maybe it's more than one move, but I was thinking just c4. c4 takes king c4, and then the thing is this is winning for white because white has an outside pass pawn. So, for example, here we go king c4, a4, b5, and uh, for example here, let's say here, and takes and here. Um, Yeah, white will be winning because of the outside pass pawn. So it's kind of neat. We started with the pa outside pass pawn example, and we kind of finished with an outside pass pawn example. Um, instead, I played d5, and I thought that, okay, maybe it's at least a draw, but the problem is I lose because after this, he played this move h6. Kings come in, but the problem is he has this very important spare temple and we can play a3 and now this is uh, winning for white because black is in zugzwang king b7 is met by king d6 and king d7 is met by king b6 um okay um there is um just to kind of recap you know we talked a lot about um uh, you know transitions in the pawn end games but since some of you guys mentioned to me the game against Sevian that I had in the US Championship, I figure I'll throw it in today. And I'll just cover one important critical moment from that game, from the end game. Of course, I will not cover all of the 140 moves that were in the game, but I'll just cover the, the starting position here of this end game. So here we have an end game which two bishops against bishop and knight, and I have an extra pawn. It should be winning, but as you guys, many of you saw, I was having a very hard time converting it. And eventually, I did win after 140 moves, but I did allow him to draw a couple of times, which he missed. And so my technique was far from ideal. Um, so the question is, um, what should the white play? And then the last question was, taking on e5 immediately necessary? No, it was not, but I was. it was still losing no matter what. I mean, I checked it with the computer. 
Um, anyway, let's let's look at this one. So I'll just ask you for one moment right here. What do you guys think would be the best plan for white here? The reason I'm throwing it in today is because it's a little bit of a review from the from the topic that I talked about in the last lesson, which was about principle of two weaknesses. Um, and uh, this one applies here as well, I feel. And uh, during the game, I didn't find the right plan. And as a result, I had a very difficult task of, of winning. So the question is, how do we try to create a second weakness here? And what could be the, the best uh, plan? Bishop b5 is actually what I played. Um, but then, let's say he goes knight f8. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can do that. But then I can play knight e6. Let's say bishop b6. <coughs> F, I don't know, king f8. And then the thing is, once I play c5, he goes knight d4 and he blockades the pawn. Actually, so. I mean, b, I mean um, bishop to c4. That's what I was looking at. Oh, yeah, I thought you said working the pawn. I'm sorry. I said, I said Oh, okay, okay, I see. Because I'm thinking in long term, sure. to keep it there and then work this side up with the pawn to eventually get the uh, pawn on e7 to move. Well, we can't move because of the you know, check. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Yeah, I mean, then I'll, I'll probably go king f8, then I'll play f6, king e7, I'll still be able to activate the king. Um, h4, h5, like a super GM. Well, then I think black can play g5, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think j fix is correct. We want to play f4 here. And the idea, actually, of f4 is what we really want to accomplish here is we want to gain more space. Play f5, g4. And then the idea is bringing the king up and maybe even exchange the bishops. And what f4, f5 does is that, like, let's say he plays knight f8, like, in the game. Um, we could try a five, and uh, the thing is, it fixes that pawn on on g on g seven, which could be rather weak, right? So it's going to be very difficult for him to activate the king as a result. Um, and um, if he plays f five, he cannot really do that because bishop c four, bishop e six, right? So that's kind of important. So the real idea is I want to play g4, f5, king f2, king e3. And he's going to be tied down to his, uh, to his king side, right? I'm going to at some point create either a weak g pawn or something along those lines, right? And he, cannot, he does not really have a, a, a great way to play here. Um, like knight f8, we can probably play f5. Um, or, or although you can also go king f2 here, bishop e5, f6 this, and then play, maybe activate the king a little bit later as well. But I, I personally think that f5 is, is probably even easier. Um, yeah, I mean, it's still a difficult endgame to convert, but I think if I would have caught the right plan earlier, I probably could have had a chance to win easier. But instead, I played at some point the move f3, which was uh, not that great, it kind of, um, it, do it does block the bishop, but the thing is, the bis I don't really need to restrict the bishop here. The bishop still has room to go. And then later on, he kind of got a little bit of a fortress type position, and yeah, I was having a hard time trying to, trying to convert that, and uh, yeah, like I said, um, later on it was could have been a draw, but I was able to win the game. So just a little bit of a review of, uh, of that previous topic, I thought. Um, all right, so hope you guys enjoyed it. Do, do you guys have any preference for next? Because my next Tuesday will be my last end game course. So does anyone have a specific preference on which exact end game topic you guys would want to see for next, for next week? Uh, please type it in your chat if you want to see something in, in particular, and I'll do my best to accommodate that. So, let's. all right, Queen End Games, please. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to definitely include some Queen End Games. All right, love the Pawn End Game. Okay, so Pawn End Games, 
Um, all right, so the thing about queen endgames and pawn endgames, they both, all right, somebody's saying minor piece endgame. Okay, so that's a little bit. Um, all the options, yeah. Uh, what about you guys? What do you think? <laughs> and somebody said rook end games, which uh, of course are also very instructive. And, and okay, we got another vote for rook end games. So, um, <laughs> okay, well we'll. Uh, we'll do our best. I'll try to. Yeah, most practical are rook end games. Yes. Um, I actually have some very instructive rook end games, um, but they are probably that's that's probably material for like masters and above. So I I also want to make sure I you know I don't kill you guys. Uh, uh, Ah, you mean a uh, bridge from middle game to end game? Yeah, something like that. Like, I think the easy ones I can sort of figure out, but then I want to know the middle game and kind of the way that I can just change the Middle game to end game transition, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that that could be a, could be an option, yeah. How about imbalance situations like knight versus bishop? Knight versus, yeah, minor piece end game. Oh, yeah, is that what's meant by minor piece? Yeah. Potentially, yeah. Knight against bishop, to bishop against bishop, or or knight against knight, right? Clump, complex. Okay, so it seems like everybody wants something a little bit different. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, ha I'll have to be creative and think about the, the best content there. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I'll have to ponder on that a little bit, and um, you know, we'll. Uh, so I'll see you guys uh, next week then for my last end game course. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you next week. Thank you.